We are in the, the anniversary of America's involvement in World War One, the beginning of America's involvement in World War One, uh, which came in April of 1917. Uh, and there are a number of events going on in the community to commemorate that, uh, and this is one. It is uh, funded by the Gear Gilda Learman uh, Foundation, and we are happy to have their their input into this. What we're going to do today is have, uh, I'm going to set up uh, each time a series of primary source readings um, from a text about World War I based on primary sources. It was put together by Scott Berg, uh, who many of you may remember as a Pulitzer Prize winning biographer. Uh, among his biographies is one of Woodrow Wilson, which is particularly uh, interesting for those of us in Augusta because Woodrow Wilson had his boyhood here during the Civil War, which affected his own uh, outlook about war in general. And, and I'll say a few words about that as we go along. The other part of this is the readings coming from these primary sources uh, on seven, seven different topics, and I will introduce each one of those, are going to be done by veterans. Not, of course, of World War I, but uh, <laughs> veterans um, uh, from other American wars. Uh, on the far right there is Tom Sutherland, who was uh, an Army officer for 20 years in the 82nd Airborne, uh, 1st Special Forces Group. Um, when I met Tom, he was working at Reese Library at what was then Augusta College. He worked at Greenback Flat Library at MCG and the library of the Savannah River site, uh, the laboratory there. Uh, he now is retired and is a docent uh, both here and at the Mars Museum of Art. Our second veteran is Kathleen Barnhart who um, was accepted into the Army Student Nurse Program in 1968 and has served uh, uh, in various capacities since then, active duty at Sam Houston um, Group Army Medical Center. Um, she joined the Army Reserve in um, 1980 with the 382nd Field Hospital, um, completed the Army Advanced Course in Command uh, and General uh, Staff College. Uh, she was in Saudi Arabia uh, at the uh, King Fahd Saudi Arabian National Guard Hospital in Riyadh uh, during Desert Storm and retired after 22 years of service as a lieutenant colonel. And then finally, Chris Miller Batts, whose face is probably familiar to many people. Uh, Chris was a second lieutenant in the Army. Uh, she served as a counselor and education services specialist and education services officer. Uh, for military personnel in Germany um, and uh, at Fort Gordon, uh, sir, uh, teaching um, training officers in signal leadership. Um, I know Chris Best as really one of the founders and longtime now director of the Lucy Craft Laney Museum of Black History, um, which has been an invaluable addition to our knowledge of history in Augusta and um, to the culture of the neighborhood in which the museum uh, stands. So these are our readers of primary sources, and I am going to set them up. Hopefully I can do it from this podium. Okay. So when the war began in Europe uh, in 1914, years before the Americans got in, um, Americans had different reactions to it. Uh, most of them basically wanted us to stay out of it. They saw it as a European war. Um, but people had tendencies to support one side or the other, um, more leaning toward the Allied side, although there were some groups, for example, Irish Americans, a lot of them supported the German side to begin with, or had, had leanings uh, of sympathies toward the German side because of their resentment of the issues that were going on between Ireland and Britain at the time. So it, it's complicated sometimes. However, as the war proceeded, um, things increasingly happened that pushed more Americans into sympathy with the Allied side. Um, things like being, 
invasion through neutral Belgium, a new, new um, boat warfare, unrestricted submarine warfare, as it was called, including, of course, the 1915 uh, Lusitania incident, the Armenian massacre. Uh, all of these things um, hurt whatever sympathies Germany may have had, um, or even neutrality Germany may have had uh, among Americans. Uh, and some Americans volunteered for service with the Allies before we were ever officially in the war. Um, in February 1917, when Germany returned to its policy, kind of negating the Sussex Pledge of 1916 and returned to unrestricted submarine warfare, along with the British interception of what, what is known as the Zimmerman Note or the Zimmerman Telegram that offered Mexico um, land back, basically, that they had lost in the Mexican-American War if they would support the German side, um, Wilson felt that he had no choice but for America to become uh, involved in the war. Now, I will say um, there, there was never complete support for this war in the United States. There were some pretty prominent Americans, people like the reformer uh, of, of uh, settlement house movement, Jane Addams, Henry Ford, Andrew Carnegie. Um, Andrew Carnegie would found the Carnegie International Peace Organization um, as a result of this. Um, but in general, Americans got behind what they needed to do. So our first readings come from uh, some of those early Americans to, to get captured into the war spirit uh, and involve themselves in the war uh, before America's own declaration. Our first reading comes from the Second Battle of Champagne or Champagne um, in France. This is a letter from a young man named Alan Seeger to his mother, Elsie Simmons Seeger, in September of 1914. Uh, Seeger had graduated from Harvard, um, spent a couple of years in the United States, and then decided to live in Paris for a couple of years. And he was in Paris uh, when the war in Europe began. So he joined the French Foreign Legion along with 20 other Americans, and his first major battle experience came in the Battle of Champagne. And now we're back in the far rear again. The battle is over, and in the peace of our little village, we can sum up the results of the big offensive in which we took part. No one denies that they are disappointing, for we know who heard and cheered the order of Joffrey to the order before the battle, that it was not merely a fight for a position, but a supreme effort to pierce the German line and liberate the invaded country. We know the immense preparation for the attack, what confidence our officers had in its success, and what enthusiasm ourselves. True, we broke their first line along a wide front, advanced on an average of three or four kilometers, took numerous prisoners and cannon. It was a satisfaction at last to get out of the trenches, to meet the enemy face to face, and to see German arrogance turn into suppliance. We knew many splendid moments worth having endured many trials for, but in our larger aim of piercing their line, of breaking the long deadlock, of entering Vosgeres in triumph, of course we failed. There should really be no neutrals in a conflict like this, where there is not a people whose interests are not involved. To neutrals who have stomached what America has consented to stomach from Germany, whose ideals are so opposed to hers, who in the event of a German victory would be so inevitably embroiled the question he put to himself and so resolutely answered will become more and more pertinent. On the, four, on the 2nd of April, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson went to Congress to ask for a declaration of war. He held the German government, not its people, responsible for what was going on. The Kaiser and his government were too militaristic, and Wilson saw that it would be a positive benefit for the world, really, 
if Germany were, were put on a more democratic, open path. He was convinced that the United States could create a more peaceful world. He received applause from the assembled senators and congressmen. Wilson had grown up in Augusta, Georgia, in the American Civil War, and he remembered war. He remembered the wounded and dying men that were brought to his father's church, First Presbyterian, after the Battle of Chickamauga. He knew the downside of war. He knew it was a message of death. And he said as he walked away, how strange it seems to applaud that. We are accepting this challenge of hostile purpose because we know that in such a government, following such methods, we can never have a friend. And that in the presence of its organized power, always lying in wait to accomplish we know not what purpose, there can be no assured security for the democratic governments of the world. We are now about to accept gauge a battle with this natural foe to liberty and shall, if necessary, spend the whole force of the nation to check and nullify its pretensions and its power. We are glad, now that we see the facts, with no veil of false pretense about them, to fight thus for the ultimate peace of the world and for the liberation of its peoples, the German peoples included, for the rights of nations great and small and the privilege of men everywhere to choose their way of life and of obedience. The world must be made safe for democracy. Its peace must be planted upon the tested foundations of political liberty. We have no selfish ends to serve. We desire no conquest, no dominion. We seek no indemnities for ourselves no material compensation for the sacrifices we shall freely make. We are but one of the champions of the rights of mankind. We shall be satisfied when those rights have been made as secure as a faith and the freedom of nations can make them. There are, it may be, many months of fiery trial and sacrifice ahead of us. It is a fearful thing to lead this great, peaceful people into war, into the most terrible and disastrous of all wars, civilization itself seeming to be in the balance. But the right is more precious than peace, and we shall fight for the things which we have always carried nearest our hearts, for democracy, for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own governments, for the rights and liberties of small nations, for a universal dominion of right by such a concert of free peoples as shall bring peace and safety to all nations and make the world itself at last free. To such a task we can dedicate our lives and our fortunes, everything that we are and everything that we have, with the pride of those who know that the day has come when America is privileged to spend her blood and her might for the principles that gave her birth and happiness and the peace which she has treasured. God helping her, she can do no other. It will be all the easier for us to conduct ourselves as belligerents in a high spirit of right and fairness because we act with our animus and enmity toward a people or with the desire to bring any injury or disadvantage upon them, but only in armed opposition to the irresponsible government which has thrown aside all considerations of humanity and of right and a running amok. We are, let me say, the sincere friends of the German people and shall desire nothing so much as the early reestablishment of intimate relations of mutual advantage between us. However, hard it may be for that. For the time being, to believe that this is spoken from our hearts. We have borne with their present government through all these bitter months because of that friendship, exercising a patience and a forbearance which would otherwise have been impossible. We shall happily still 
have an opportunity to prove that friendship and our daily attitude and actions toward the millions of men and women of German birth and native sympathy who live among us and share our life. And we shall be proud to provide or prove it toward all who are in fact loyal to this neighbor and to government in the hour of test. They are, most of them, and true and loyal Americans as if they had never known any other delta or allegiance. Now, as I said, there were people who were opposed to this war, and our next reading comes from a report of the St. Louis Socialist Convention um, and by the way, in 1912, the socialist candidate for president of the United States, Eugene Debs, got almost a million votes in America. Uh, so there was a movement um, in that direction among a minority of Americans at the time. Um, the, the socialists tended to see this as a war of capitalism. Uh, and so this next reading is from um, the Socialist uh, Party of America, uh, their report from their convention about uh, the U.S. entry into the war. The war of the United States against Germany cannot be justified even on the plea that it is a war in defense of American rights or American honor. Ruthless as the unrestricted submarine war policy of the German government was and is, it is not an invasion of the rights of the American people as such but only an interference with the opportunity of certain groups of American capitalists to coin cold profits out of the blood and sufferings of our fellow men in the warring countries of Europe. It is not a war against the militaristic regime of the central powers. Militarism can never be abolished by militarism. It is not a war to advance the cause of democracy in Europe. Democracy can never be imposed upon any country by a foreign power, by force of arms. It is Kant and hypocrisy to say that the war is not directed against the German people, but against the imperial government of Germany. If we send an armed force to the battlefields of Europe, its cannon will mow down the masses of the German people and not the imperial German government. Our entrance into the European conflict at this time will serve only to multiply the horrors of the war to increase the toll of death and destruction, and to prolong the fiendish slaughter. It will bring death, suffering, and destitution to the people of the United States, and particularly to the working class. It will give the powers of reaction in this country the pretext for an attempt to throttle our rights and to crush our democratic institutions, and to fasten upon this country a permanent militarism. <coughs> So we're going to look at the experiences of war um, by some of the Americans who, who actually fought. Um, those who experienced war were changed. We see that in our own society. People come home from war. <coughs> um, some were traumatized. Uh, some were uplifted by the experiences they had. But as the author of this text says, for most, quote, war was a mixture of good and bad that left a legacy of ambivalence, end quote. Reading one is, um, uh, comes from James Norman Hall, an American who had been vacationing in Britain in the summer of 1914. He was caught up in the war fever in Britain uh, he claimed to be Canadian so he could sign up and fight with the British. He served with the 9th Royal Fusiliers before being discharged in December of 1915. So he's in there um, over a year uh, as a British soldier. Um, but when they found out his true citizenship, uh, they put him out. Uh, he returned to the United States and wrote a memoir before returning to fight in France later when the U.S. got in. This passage describes part of his uh, experience from the Battle of Blues, and this is when he was fighting as a, quote, Canadian. 
When the bombardment began, all off-duty men were ordered into the deepest of the shell-proof dugouts, where they were really quite safe. But those English lads were not cowards. Orders or no orders, they came out to the rescue of their comrades. They worked without a thought of their own danger. I felt actually happy, for I was witnessing splendid heroic things. It was an experience which gave one a new and unshakable faith in his fellows. The sergeant and I rushed into the ruins of our machine gun dugout. The roof still held in one place. There we found Mac, his head split in two as though it had been done with an axe. Gardner's head was blown completely off, and his body was so terribly mangled that we did not know until later who he was. Preston was lying on his back with a great, jagged, blood-stained hole through his tongue. Bert Powell was so badly hurt that we exhausted our supply of field dressings in bandaging him. We found little Charlie Harrison lying close to the side of the wall, gazing at his crushed foot with a look of incredulity and horror, pitiful to see. One of the men gave him first aid with all the deafness and tenderness of a woman. The rest of us dug hurriedly into a great heap of earth at the other end of the shelter. We quickly uncovered Walter, the lad who had kept us laughing at his drollery on many a rainy night. The earth had been heaped loosely on him, and he was still conscious. Good old boys, he said weakly, I was about done for. In our haste, we dislodged another heap of earth, which completely buried him again and it seemed a lifetime before we were able to remove it. I've never seen a finer display of pure grip than Walter's. <coughs> Easy now, he said. Can't feel anything below me waist. I think I'm hurt down there. We worked as swiftly and as carefully as we could. We knew that he was badly wounded, for the earth was soaked with blood. But when we saw, we turned away sick with horror. Fortunately, he lost consciousness while we were trying to disentangle him from the fallen timbers, and he died on the way to the field dressing station. Of the seven lads in the dugout, three were killed outright, three died within half an hour, and one escaped with a crushed foot, which had to be amputated at the field hospital. During the afternoon, I heard for the first time the hysterical cry of a man whose nerve had given way. He picked up an arm and threw it far out in front of the trenches, shouting as he did so in a way that made one's blood run cold. Then he sat down and started crying and moaning. He was taken back to the rear, one of the saddest casualties in a war of inconceivable horrors. This is a poem written by Alan Seeger, who we heard a minute ago uh, in a letter to his mother. This poem was written in early 1916. That July, he was killed uh, in an angle of French offensive along the Somme River. Um, the poems were published posthumously in December. Uh, his death led his brother Charles, uh, a well-known musicologist, to become an opponent of US intervention. And you've probably heard of Charles's son, Pete Seeger, who would be a singer for another war. So this is a poem written and published posthumously by Alan Seeger. I have a rendezvous with death at some disputed barricade when spring comes back with rustling shade and apple blossoms. I have a rendezvous with death. When spring brings back blue days and fair, it may be he shall take my hand and lead me into his dark lane and close my eyes and quench my breath. It may be I shall pass and see. I have a rendezvous with death. On some scared slope of battered hill, when spring comes round again this year and the first meadow flowers appear, God knows was better, pillared and silk and scented down, where love throbs 
out in blissful sleep, pulse now, pulse, and breath to breath. We're hushed, awakening, a dear, but I, a rendezvous with death. At midnight and some flaming down, when spring trips north again this year, and I too, my pledge, word and truth, I shall not fail that grant. After the U.S. declaration of the war, we of course began getting troops across the Atlantic, the great American expeditionary force, the AEF under Black Jack Pershing, who prior to this had been chasing Pancho Villa around in Mexico. Um, the uh, AEF was in the battle in September of 1918 uh, on the front from the Argonne Forest to the Meuse River. It lasted until uh, November the 11th, when the armistice was called. Ashby William commanded a division of the 320th Infantry of the 1st Battalion. While advancing in, on September the 25th, they came under artillery fire. We could hear the explosion as the shell left the muzzle of the Bosch gun, then the noise of the shell as it come, came toward us faint at first, then louder and louder until the shell struck and shook the earth with its explosion. One can only feel, one cannot describe the horror that fills the mind and heart during this short interval of time. You know he is aiming a gun at you and wants to kill you. In your mind you see him swab out the hot barrel. You see him thrust in the deadly shell and place the bundle of explosives in the breech. You see the gunner throw all his weight against the trigger. You hear the explosion like the single bark of a great dog in the distance. And you hear the deadly missile singing as it comes towards you, faintly at first, then distinctly, then louder and louder until it seems so loud that everything else has died and then the earth shakes and the eardrums ring and the dirt and iron reverberate through the woods and fall about you. This is what you hear, but no man can tell what surges through the heart and mind as you lie with your face upon the ground listening to the growing sound of the hellish thing as it comes toward you. You do not think. Sorrow only fills the heart and you only hope and pray. And when the doubly damned thing hits the ground, you take a breath and feel relieved and think how good God has been to you again. And God was good to us that night, to those of us who escaped unhurt. And for the ones who were killed, poor fellows, some blown to fragments that could not be recognized, and the men who were hurt, we said a prayer in our hearts. Well, there were um, issues uh, within America and within the American forces uh, during the war. Uh, the government called for 100% Americanism, um, but some Americans had not been treated as 100% Americans in their own society. Uh, African Americans felt it more deeply than other ethnic groups. In fact, um, one of the things that we see happening in the South in World War I is what's known as the Great Migration of African Americans out of the South, attracted to the North by jobs in the factories there. The black press, uh, in spite of racist issues, encouraged blacks to do their part in the war, and one of those um, members of the press who did that was W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, really one of the great intellectuals of the black community uh, in this period. Um, there were uh, efforts here in Augusta to support that. It, the Pilgrim Health and Life Insurance Company board minutes uh, show a discussion about buying liberty bonds and saying, quote, perhaps if we help bring democracy abroad, we will have more democracy at home, unquote. Over 380,000 blacks served in the United States Army. Most of those were relegated to uh, labor kind of duties, but two black divisions did see action on the Western Front, the 92nd,
which was American commanded, and the 93rd, made up mainly of black National Guard regiments who had been assigned to the French Army. The 369th of that group became known as the Harlem Hellfighters, and you may have heard of the Harlem Hellfighters. The next two readings are from W.E. Du Bois. The first one is an editorial supporting the war, encouraging black Americans to forget their grievances for the time being. It is entitled, Close Ranks. This is a crisis of the world. For all the long years we come, men will point to the year 1915 at the great day of decision. The day when the world decided whether it would submit to military deposition and an endless armed of peace. If peace it could be called, or whether they would put down the mess of German militarism and an rape of the United States of America. We of the colored race have no ordinary interest in the outcome. That which the German power represents today spells death and the aspiration of Negroes and all dark races for equality, freedom, and democracy. Let me not hesitate. Let us, while this was last, forget our special grievances and close our ranks shoulder to shoulder with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it glad and willing with our eyes lifted to the hills. In the second reading that Du Bois entitled Returning Soldiers, um, and this was written in May of 1919, so after the war is over and the troops are gradually beginning to come home. Um, he uh, notes that uh, many were disillusioned, um, but determined, perhaps more than ever, to fight for civil rights. The new Negro, he said, that had the spirit of resistance, and he tries to capture this in the crisis, the journal of the NAACP. We are returning from war, the crisis in 10, of thousands of black men were drafted into a great struggle for bleeding France and what she means and has meant and will mean to us and humanity. And against the threat of German race arrogance, we fought gladly and to the last drop of blood. For America and her highest ideas, we fought in far off hope. For the dominant Southern oligarchy, entrenched in Washington. We fought in bitter resignation. For the America that represents and gloats in legend, disfranchisement, caste, brutality, and deathless insult. For this, the hateful upturning and mixing of things, we were forced by the predicted fate to fight also. But today we return from the slavery of uniform, which the world's madness demanded us to don, to the freedom of civil guard. We stand again to look America squarely in the face and call a spade a spade. This country of ours, despite all of its better souls, have done and dreamed, it yet is a shameful land. It lynches. It disfranchises its own citizens. It encourages ignorance. It steals from us. It insults us. This is the country to which we soldiers of democracy return. This is the fatherland for which we fought. But it is our fatherland. It is right for us to fight. The faults of our country are our own faults. Under similar circumstances, we would fight again. But by the God of heaven, we are cowards. Now that war is over, we do not marshal every ounce of our brain 
and Brahma, to Father Sterner, Mama, more unbending battle against the forces of hell in our own land. Even before the U.S. Uh, was in the war, women had also become involved in a variety of ways, including the, the Red Cross uh, over in Europe. When, you at, when in the United States, um, when the United States came into the war, women did their part by taking the jobs left behind by departing soldiers, making goods that were needed, including bandages and uh, clothing, producing food. The Women's Land Army began to produce food. Some went to war, uh, they worked as clerks, they worked as telephone operators, um, and of course, many worked as nurses. Reading one comes from a woman named Mary Borden. She was a wealthy woman who had graduated from Vassar. Uh, she, uh, was, she funded herself uh, and managed a military hospital in Fran uh, for the French in Belgium. It began operating in July of 1915. Um, in August of 1916, she became the director of another military hospital uh, at Ray sur Somme uh, in the Battle of the Somme. She treated wounded from the ongoing campaign of the Somme and published a memoir in 1929 called The Forbidden Zone, which were um, sketches from her own wartime experience. It is all arranged. Ten kilometers from here along the road is the place where men are wounded. This is the place where they are mended. We have all the things here for mending, the tables and the needles and the thread and the knives and the scissors, and many curious things that you never use for your clothes. We bring our men up along the dusty road where the bushes grow on either side and the green trees. They come by in the mornings in companies, marching with strong legs with firm steps. They carry their knapsacks easily. Their knapsacks and their guns and their greatcoats are not heavy for them. They wear their caps jauntily, tilted to one side. Their faces are ruddy and their eyes bright. They smile and call out with strong voices. They throw kisses for the girls in the fields. We send our men up the broken road between bushes of barbed wire, and they come back to us, one by one, two by two in ambulances, lying on stretchers. They lie on their backs on the stretchers and are pulled out of the ambulances and loaves of bread are pulled out of the oven. The stretchers slide out of the mouths of the ambulances with their men on them. It is only 10 kilometers up the road, the place where they go to be torn again and mangled. Listen, you can hear how well it works. There is the sound of cannon and the sound of the ambulances bringing the wounded and the sound of the tramp of strong men going along the road to fill the empty places. Do you hear? Do you understand? It is all arranged just as it should be. Shirley Millard um, was a, a nurse, and she wrote about one of the issues that women um, at the front had to deal with, um, what today we would call um, sexual harassment. Um, that was just something that women had to deal with back then. There wasn't much they could do about it. Um, and she talks about this for both herself and her fellow nurses. And she gives this uh, example. Um, May 13th, 1918. Today, as I was coming through the quad, corridor in the officer's ward with a tray in my hand, I met Dr. Gerard. I hardly know him. He has been in the theater, as they call the surgery, almost constantly since I arrived. He stared at me in an odd sort of way and would not let me pass. Then he took the tray from my hand, set it on the window ledge, and without further ado, grabbed me in his arms and kissed me vigorously. I struggled free with some difficulty, and he gravely handed me the tray again and then began walking along beside me as if nothing had happened. I was quite upset because someone might have come along. 
but thank goodness no one did. I thought his behavior very undignified and silly, and I told him so. I tried to hurry away from him, but he deliberately kept step with me, and although he looked exactly as if we were discussing medical matters, he was calling me all sorts of pet names and asking me when I would go to Paris with him. I said, absolutely never, and ducked into a ward. I don't think absolutely never is very good French, but I hope he knew what I meant. Um, and it's interesting because um, you know, this was just something that, that wasn't seen as unusual, and she was afraid that people would see because it would have reflected badly on her um, as opposed to him. Um, finally, um, Willa Cather, <coughs> the great novelist, wrote an essay about the effect of the war on America's heartland, uh, showing women's efforts at home uh, and on the home front during the war. The afternoon whist club had become a Red Cross sewing circle, and there were no parties but war parties. <coughs> There were no town band concerts anymore because the band was in France. No football, no baseball, no skating rink. The merchants and bankers went out into the country after business hours and worked late into the night, helping the farmers, whose sons were gone, to save their grain. Wherever I went out in the country among the farms, the women met at least once a week at some appointed farmhouse to cut out garments get their Red Cross instructions and materials, and then take the garments home to sew on them whatever they could. <coughs> they went on in every farmhouse. American women, Swedish women, Germans, Norwegians, Bohemians, Canadian, French women, sewing and knitting. An old Danish grandmother, well along in her 90s, was knitting socks. Her memory was failing, and half the time she thought she was knitting for some other war long ago. A bedridden, a bedridden woman who lived down by the depot begged the young girls who went canvassing to bring garments to her so that she could work buttonholes lying on her back. One Sunday at the Catholic Church, I saw an old woman crippled with rheumatism and palsy who had not risen during the service for years. But when the choir sang the Star Spangled Banner at the close of the Mass, she got to her feet and, using the shoulder of her little grandson for a crutch, stood her head trembling and wobbling until the last note died away. Well, as I said, America did not uh, get into the war totally unified. Wilson framed it as a war to make the world safe for democracy, a war that would end all wars. And he had to somehow bring a diverse nation into this vision uh, that he had. He appointed a journalist named George Creel to head up the Committee on Public Information. Uh, it was a committee to win the hearts and minds of the American people. And it um, came up with a, a vast propaganda uh, effort. Uh, artists did posters, uh, four-minute men went around the country delivering speeches to clubs and civic organizations and churches. Stars uh, permit, promoted liberty bonds. Uh, there was collaboration with movie studios for, of course, silent uh, film. Um, and in our first reading, George Creel talks about this war for the minds of men, for the conquest of their convictions. It was in this recognition of public opinion as a major force that the Great War differed most essentially from all previous conflicts. The trial of strength was not only between mass bodies of armed men, but between opposed ideals, and moral verdicts took on all the value of military decisions. Other wars went no deeper than the physical aspects, but German culture raised issues that had to be fought out in the hearts and minds of people, as well as on the actual firing line. The approval of the world meant the steady flow of inspiration into the trenches. It meant the strength and resolved and renewed determination of the civilian population that is a nation's second line. The condemnation of the world meant destruction and the surrender of that conviction of justice, which is the very heart of courage. 
Under the pressure of tremendous necessities, an organization grew that not only reached deep into every American community, but that carried to every corner of the civilized globe the full message of America's idealism, unselfishness, and indomitable purpose. We fought prejudice, indifference, and disaffection at home, and we fought ignorance and falsehood abroad. We strove for the maintenance of our own morale and the allied morale by every possible process of stimulation. Every possible expedient was employed to break through the barrage of lies that kept the people of the central power in darkness and delusion. We sought the friendship and support of mutual nations by continuous presentation of facts. We did not call it propaganda, for that word, in German hands, had come to be associated with deceit and corruption. Our effort was educational and informative throughout, for we had such confidence in our case as to feel that no other argument was needed than the simple, straightforward presentation of fact. The other side of keeping a united country was punishing disloyalty and questioning dissent. The Espionage Act passed on June 15th of 1917. Um, it listed as a crime any attempts to cause insubordination or mutiny in the armed forces or to inhibit recruitment enlistment. The Sedition Act, um, and the amendment to the Espionage Act passed in May of 1918 placed additional restrictions on uh, critical speech, uh, critiques of the war effort. The postmaster used that act to ban newspapers and magazines that were deemed subversive. Government and mil military officials used it to quell dissent. Opponents of the war, including the Women's Peace Party, were kept under surveillance. Anti-war activists, including Eugene Debs, were arrested and imprisoned. Um, it led to the rise of a young attorney at the Justice Department who worked against subversion at the war, whose name was J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, conviction of five uh, anarchists in the Abrams, uh, or the conviction of five anarchists was upheld in the Abrams versus the United States uh, decision of the United States Supreme Court. However, it was not a unanimous decision. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, along with Justice Lewis Brandeis, um, dissented, and Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote the dissent that said this was in violation of the First Amendment. But when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, they may come to believe even more than they believe, the very foundations of their own conduct, that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trading ideas that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, and that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our Constitution. I think that we should be eternally vigilant against attempts to check the expression of opinions, opinions that we loathe and believe to be fraught with death unless they so eminently threaten immediate interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of the law that an immediate check is required to save the country. Finally, the war um, brought America onto the world stage. Um, after the war, there were differing opinions, both abroad and at home as well, about what America's world should now, uh, role should now be in the world affairs and in keeping peace in the world. Wilson had gone to the peace talks in Versailles, but made the political mistake of not taking any Republicans uh, to the, the, the uh, conference, uh, which angered leading Republican Henry Cabot Lodge. When the treaty was brought home, uh, the Senate clashed over these two visions of America and world order. Senate opponents during the debate over the treaty of the Republicans Versailles, and remember that the Senate has to ratify treaties, um, divided into two groups. One led by Lodge were the irreconcilables. They were not going to accept the treaty no matter what. 
Another group were known as the reservationists. They were willing to accept the treaty if perhaps some changes or modifications were made. Um, and among other things, they wanted the Monroe Doctrine, uh, where America would have hegemony on this side of the world, basically, um, uh, especially in Latin America. They wanted that protected. They wanted some other changes. But Wilson would not ask for changes. He was not willing to negotiate again to reopen those negotiations. And he believed that he was right. He wanted the United States to be in the League of Nations. Uh, he wanted to work with other international groups that were dedicated to economic development and to peace. Lodge, however, was a, a nationalist and he wanted um, to, for America to have uh, more say over what it became involved in. He did not want to tie American interests to the League. Reading one comes from Woodrow Wilson's address to the Senate about the League of Nations, or for the League of Nations, on July the 10th, 1919. The League of Nations was not merely an instrument to adjust and remedy old wrongs under a new treaty of peace. It was the only hope for mankind. Again and again had the demon of war been cast out of the house of the peoples and the house swept clean by a treaty of peace, only to prepare a time when he would enter in again with the spirits worse than himself. The house must now be given a tenant who could hold it against all such. Convenient. Indeed, indispensable as statesmen found the newly planned League of Nations to be for the execution of present plans of peace and reparation, they saw it in a new aspect before their work was finished. They saw it as the main object of the peace, as the only thing that could complete it or make it worthwhile. They saw it as the hope of the world, and that hope they did not dare to disappoint. Shall we or any other free people hesitate to accept this great duty? Dare we reject it and break the heart of the world? There can be no question of our ceasing to be a world power. The only question is whether we can refuse the moral leadership that is offered us, whether we shall accept or reject the confidence of the world. The war and the conference of peace now sitting in Paris seem to me to have answered that question. Our participation in the war established our position among the nations, and nothing but our own mistaken action can alter it. It was not an accident or a matter of sudden choice that we are no longer isolated and devoted to a policy which has only our own interest and advantage for its object. It was our duty to go in, if we were indeed the champions of liberty and of right. We answer to the call of duty in a way so spirited, so utterly without thought of what we spent of blood or treasure, so effective, so worthy of the admiration of true men everywhere, so wrought out of the stuff of all that was heroic, that the whole world saw at last in the flesh, in noble action, a great ideal asserted and vindicated by a nation they had deemed material and now found to be compact of the spiritual forces that must free men of every nation from every unworthy bondage. It is thus that a new role and a new responsibility have come to this great nation that we honor and which we would all wish to lift to yet higher levels of service and achievement. The stage is set, the destiny disclosed. It has come about by no plan of our conceiving but by the hand of God who led us into this way. We cannot turn back. We can only go forward with lifted eyes and freshened spirit to follow the vision. It was of this that we dreamed at our birth. America shall in truth show the way. The light streams upon the path ahead and nowhere else. The second reading comes from Henry Cabot Lodge's speech uh, in the Senate on the League. He called the League a 
murky covenant. I am an anxious, I am as anxious as any human being can be to have the United States render every possible service to the civilization and the peace of mankind. But I am certain we can do it best by not putting ourselves in lending leading strings of subjecting our policies and our sovereignty to other nations. The independence of the United States is not only precious to ours, but to the world that any single possession can hold. I will go as far as anyone in the world service, but the first step to world service is the maintenance of the United States. You may call me selfish, if you will, conservative, or reactionary, or use any other harsh adjective you see fit to apply. But an American, I was born, and America has remained all my life. I can never be anything else but an American, and I must think of the United States first. And when I think of the United States first, in an arrangement like this, I am thinking of what is best for the world. For if the United States fell, the best hopes of mankind fell with it. I have never had but one of these. I cannot divide it now. I have loved but one flag, and I cannot share that devotion and give affection to the Marvel banner invented for the evening. No doubt many excellent and patriotic people see it coming for fulfillment of noble ideas. In the words, lead for peace. We all respect and share these aspirations and desires, but some of us see no hope, but rather defeat. For them in this murky country, for we too have our ideas, even if we differ from those who have tried to establish a monopoly of ideas. Our first idea is our country, and we see her in the future, as in the past, giving service to all people and to the world, our idea of free will. She has great problems of her own to solve, very grim and perilous problems, and a rigid solution if we can attain it, would largely benefit mankind. Well, with war over, 200,000 wounded men returned. And that number got bigger when people uh, in the 1920s began coming to hospitals with what we today would call PTSD. They called it shell shock. They also had uh, lung problems, especially related to the use of gas, poison gas, during the war. Um, and a Veterans Bureau began a system of hospitals to try to uh, deal with some of this. Many veterans also had problems finding jobs. Uh, and in 1919, the veterans themselves founded the American Legion, uh, which took the lead in trying to help veterans and to get what was called adjusted compensation. They argued that since war industrialists had made great profits, wouldn't it be fair for soldiers to be compensated as well for their sacrifice? In 1924, a law was passed that all veterans would receive an adjusted compensation bond or bonus redeemable in 1945, and if you remember the New Deal era, um, the, the Depression era, uh, there were bonus armies uh, on marching on Washington who wanted the veterans to get those bonuses early. Veterans also had problems adjusting to life at home, where families wanted them to basically put the war behind them. Uh, towns did build memorials and statues and parks. Uh, Augusta had uh, had that as well. To memorialize unknown soldiers left behind in unmarked graves or in some cases um, in the ocean, um, the United States uh, interred, uh, reinterred, one unidentified soldier 
at the Tomb of the Unknown in Arlington. Wilson, in his literally last minutes in office, had authorized the exhumation of a soldier uh, in an un unmarked grave in France. On November the 11th, three years after the armistice, President Harding delivered the address at the ceremony that reinterred this soldier in Arlington. And this is a reading from his address at the Tomb of the Unknown. Mr. Secretary of War and ladies and gentlemen, we are met today to pay the impersonal tribute. The name of him whose body lies before us took flight with his imperishable soul. We know not whence he came, but only that his death marks him with the everlasting glory of an American dying for his country. He might have come for many one of millions of American homes. Some mother gave him in her love and tenderness and with him her most cherished hopes. Hundreds of mothers are wondering today, finding a touch of solace in the possibility that the nation bows in grief over the body of one she bore to live and die, if need be, for the Republic. If we give rein to fancy, a score of sympathetic chords are touched, for in this body there once glowed the soul of an American, with the aspirations and ambitions of a citizen who cherished life and its opportunities. He may have been a native or an adopted son. That matters little because they glorified the same loyalty. They sacrificed alike. We do not know his station in life because from every station came the res patriotic response of the five millions. We do not know the eminence of his birth, but we do know the glory of his death. He died for his country, and greater devotion hath no man than this. He died unquestioning, uncomplaining, with faith in his heart and hope on his lips that his country should triumph and its civilization survive. As a typical soldier of this representative democracy, he fought and died, believing in the indisputable justice of his country's cause. Sleeping in these hallowed grounds are thousands of Americans who have given their blood for the baptism of freedom and its maintenance, armed exponents of the nation's conscience. It is better and nobler for their deeds. Burial here is rather more than a sign of the government's favor. It is a suggestion of a tomb in the heart of the nation, sorrowing for its <clears> own <throat> dead. Today's ceremonies proclaim that the hero unknown is not unhonored. We gather him to the nation's breast within the shadow of the Capitol, of the towering shaft that honors Washington, the great father, and of the exquisite monument to Lincoln, the martyred savior. Here, the inspirations of yesterday and the conscience of today forever unite to make the Republic worthy of his death for flag and country. Standing today on the hallowed ground, conscious that all America has halted to share in the tribute of heart and mind and soul to this fellow American. And knowing that the world is noted this is such a republic mindfulness, it is fitting to say that his sacrifice and that of millions dead shall not be in vain. There must be, there shall be, the commanding voice of a conscious civilization against armed warfare. As we return this poor clay to its mother's soul, garlanded by love and covered with the decorations that only nations can bestow. I can sense the prayers of our people, of all people, that this day shall mark the beginning of a new and lasting era of peace, earth, and goodwill to man. Well, it's uh, quite touching to read that know the history of the next hundred years uh, and see how um, those 
aspirations and those hopes uh, were dashed on so many occasions. 